če boste slučajno med vožnjo po Veliki Britaniji na cesti srečali takšnega Nisa na Lifa, mu nikar ne poblendajte. Tudi, če mu boste želeli odstopiti prednost takole z roko, vas ta ne bo razumel, zato ker gre za avtonomni avtomobil. Ta avtomobil se je že dokazal, da zna voziti po avtocesti. Vozil je naprimer tukaj od Kremfilda do Sunderlanda, kjer je niso nova tovarna, pa avtomobil se je tudi že dokazal v mestnem okolju. No zdaj pa je zaključen projekt, v katerem so s tem avtomobilom vozili po podeželskih cestah. In seveda, prav ta vožnja po lokalnih cestah je zares fascinantna, zato ker v teh situacijah se mora ta tehnologija odzivati, kot bi se odzival kompetenten voznik. In ja, Prav posnemanje človeškega vedenja je dejansko tisto, kar najbolj fascinira pri tem avtomobilu. Ampak zdaj čas, da se grem veljati. Did you experience during the drives some of the angry drivers behind you? Not, not in this vehicle. We are, we are rarely the slow vehicle. So as you will see today, we are driving when safe to do so at the highest speed it can manage. What I've taught my Japanese colleagues is the expression, go reen. And I made them say it back to me, go reen. And then I said, now make it go on the go of go reen. And so when you now see the vehicle, so before it would go green, and then maybe one, one second later, the car would go. Now it goes straight away. Well, that is fast. Mm -hmm. You have mentioned humanizing technology. Yes. <laughs> technology and humans, that, that, that is so, something that cannot go together. <laughs> so what we're trying to do is develop a car that, that mimics a competent human or, or, or an advanced human driver. So a car that thinks like a human. A car that thinks like a competent human. <laughs> okay, and what I mean by a competent human is somebody, especially in the rural aspect, who's always glancing to their left and glancing to their right. Actually, an autonomous vehicle is looking to its left, looking to its right, looking forward and looking rearward all at the same time. It will be safer. Why is rural mm -hmm. driving so advanced? Uh, if so, you compare it to yeah, the highway yeah. and the yeah, urban. So the road surface, it's not very good. The lane markings are not very good, mm -hmm. but also the speeds of both vehicles is quite high. You have, say, around 200 kilometers net in both directions. This means decision making of vehicles and their speed needs to be made incredibly quickly. Uh -huh. So many of the systems on this vehicle have to be run at a much higher rate. But that also means a lot more computing power. Similar, but just reallocated for city, we yeah. have to look at the pedestrians. We have to manage the, all of the vehicles around us to maintain their position. For here, we focus on very few vehicles, but mm. making decisions very quickly. Give me a figure, how quickly? The normal calculation is about 10 hertz, would be there's a constant cycle of for the city. That is maintaining all, where all the objects are. For here, we at the fastest, you have like 30 hertz. So 30 times a second, this calculation needs to be run. It's true, okay. A competent driver can also be angry driver, yes. scared driver. Yes, and this is where we come to inclusivity, what, what we're trying to do, and you are right. Key message, first of all, is we are not trying to take the fun out of driving. What we're trying to do is take the boredom out or the anxiety or the stress out. When people go down onto motorways, down the slip road, there are people who, I call it slip road phobia, they start giving way when they should be picking up speed. When they get on the motorway, the cars around are going high speed. People get stressed, don't like this. And then you go into the city centres. Too much signage. Which lane should I be in? What's over there? What, who's that? What were they doing? And then, of course, rural roads. You know, some people don't know this area. You've been diverted late at night off the motorway or something like that. That happens a lot in the UK. And you're diverted off and you get stressed. You press the AD button, it gets you through that bit. And then when you get the other side and say, oh, I know this bit of the road, I'll take over. This is fun. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're trying to do. And that's what we're trying to achieve. That's kind of future I want. Did we go very close to the curb? Yes, we moved to go close to the curb, but the vehicle knows how wide it is, so that's why we can get so within a centimetre. Yeah, that was curb. really less than 10 centimetres. Yes, I would say. <laughs> yes. It will always try to stay in the centre of the lane, 
but it's adaptable. So if we detect a large oncoming vehicle, a bus, yeah. a lorry, we will reduce our speed, give ourselves more thinking time, more processing time, and the vehicle also may move to the left slightly to give more room. We were doing testing in the winter, and the grass in the verge on the left-hand side was way back. Uh -huh. So as we came to summer and these sorts of times, then we discovered the vehicle was moving slightly further to the left, because as it understood that the whatever the lane boundary was closer to it than it was originally. So we now do a scan using the LiDAR to detect the, both the location, but also have an estimation of its density. So if it is grass, we can put a wheel on it if we have to, but we would prefer to remain to, on the road surface. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, what about the leaves on the trees during the winter and summer? This creates it's... blind spots. On these country roads, there are always blind spots. Yeah. But you are correct, in the summer months, when it, or the spring I should say, it blooms and you get more trees. And in those occasions, then we were able to detect more blind spots in lots of corners that we did not see before. What we have to do in Europe compared with Japan the car has to be more assertive, OK? Uh -huh. Not aggressive, assertive, OK? And what I mean by that is when you've got two lanes, but there's parked cars either side, there's cars coming the other way, and then there's a gap. The car needs to say to itself, that gap's sufficient for me, I can go yeah. up there and do that. If it's not assertive enough, there'll be a human-driven car behind getting very annoyed, yeah. tooting yeah. the horn yeah. and saying, come on, get on with it. If you can do that in London, you can do that in the majority of UK cities. And there is no reason as well why it can't be done in any European city as well. Also yeah. in Italy. There, right. <laughs> there is, I was just coming up, there is a level of, in, level of assertiveness then, you know. Let's say, yeah, we, it's, it's not aggressive, but you, maybe it's high level of assertiveness, OK? <laughs> On that side, so yes. We saw a parked car here uh, on yes. the left side. As a competent driver, I would slow down a little bit and then maybe go a little bit further to the right, yes. just to be sure that the driver won't open the doors. Yes. Is this something that you can predict or no? Uh, so we, we did reduce our speed slightly. Um, the only thing here is that part of our safety case is the vehicle did move within the lane to the right, but we didn't move into the adjacent lane due to our safety case of having to move into an oncoming vehicle potentially. So you cannot uh, cross move the lane? In, yes. On the, okay, why not? Due to the, the, the safety and like our risk assessment, we're put... Of course, but you have a long range LiDAR in the front so you know that there's no one so currently in this project we haven't developed that function so next project yeah <laughs> we want a society eventually that they'll go ah that's an autonomous vehicle that doesn't understand a flashing of lights or bribing a horn i will just go on my way so that is something that happened Yes, yes, we've, <laughs> had, we've, we've had a situation down in london where somebody flashed their lights to let the car go and then the car didn't go so they flashed twice, they flashed three times, <laughs> and then they got really annoyed and accelerated off. You know, we've, we have this, um, in, in the UK, we have this uh, company called Starship, uh, autonomous pods going along uh -huh. the pavement. Mm -hmm. And I live in the town where it was deployed seven years ago. Uh -huh. And seven years ago, people used to try and ride them, pick them up, have their pictures taken with them. Seven years on, everybody just ignores them and they just go about their business. And that's what we're looking for, for an autonomous vehicle. What about cyclists? We tend to be quite patient. We, are, we stay behind. We have a few uh, animals. We've had deer, fox, we've had a squirrel. We will see as we come into NCCE. Oh. You will maybe see with the goose. With the goose. There's a very uh, naughty goose up here. <laughs> <laughs> it keeps walking in front of us. And because the car is very patient, it's in the water today. <laughs> yeah, he's behaving himself, good man. What about um, drunk driving? or using autonomous car after drinking in a pub? That would have to be a level five. Following the rules of the road, you can't drink and drive. So of yeah, course. of course. So if somebody was to get in the car straight away and just press the button and say, take me home, and then there was no hands on the wheel, feet of the, the AD car would do that kind of thing. But if that person said, oh, I can drive this little bit, that's a different technology we would have to look at. That's, <laughs> that's outside of the autonomous vehicle sphere. And you'd have to make sure that the person wouldn't take over the wheel at any time. Yeah. There are ways, you know, the car gives you a breathalyzer test and says, no, you're not able to drive, I'll drive you home. The law could be, you can do it, but you've got to be sat in the back seat. So another, another project. Another project, yeah. <laughs> 
If I will touch the steering wheel and pull it, what would happen? Uh, the vehicle would want to go back to its path, so I can demonstrate now, so I can move the vehicle off its path where it wants to go. Uh -huh. And then it very smoothly transitions back to where it wants to be. So is it fighting? Is it no. turning off the, the, the system? No, the system, if, it, if I put a large input or I interact with the pedals, then it will put the system into a standby mode, and then I just reactivate. But say, same mm -hmm. again, I can just move it off the path where, from where it wants to go. So if I want to drive into the, into the vehicle, but, for example, like this, what would yeah. happen? It would then detect that you're going to make contact with that vehicle and then the vehicle the will stop. Will stop. Yeah. Okay. What are uh, the possibilities that we will get these cars as soon as possible on the roads? Our aim is to launch this technology first as a service. So it yeah. is not to sell to the individual customers yet. If we start the service, people will start to use it people will see a new business chance. And that's how we want to bring our partners to actually develop more technology. But first you need to convince the authorities. In the UK and also in the EU, recently there were two directives that came out that allowed us to actually test this car on the public road. So this is a very good sign that we can actually start really thinking about launching the service in the UK and the EU. Now we have to talk with all authorities more, making sure that this car self-driving will harmonize with the existing uh, traffic. And we have to make sure that authorities put a set of right rules. What are the challenges? We are actually inviting many authorities to actually experience this technology. They are very convinced about the technology mm -hmm. itself. So it's a, it's a matter of insurance? It is one side about insurance. Then the other side is, what do we need to achieve? What are the check boxes that we have to tick? We have to identify what are the items that we have to check. What kind of check boxes? Can you give me some example? Traffic signals. Will it uh, recognize pedestrians? Will it recognize bicycles, other cars? And also, there are many, many signs on the road or speed bumps and other bollards, many unmovable objects. It has to recognize all of those items. And then also there is going to be a point that it would have to recognize how the other cars move. And that is something the government also wants to hear our opinion. And we would also need to talk there. We have four long range sliders. These are doing the longer detection. Then we have two wide angle. So this is doing a broader down the left and right hand side. Specifically very useful in our city case where you have all these objects moving very quickly nearby. Yeah. Then we have 15 cameras on this vehicle. But also then the final sensor is the radar, which is used as a backup for use of our ECC. So to figure out what speed the vehicle in front is going at. Tesla says that we can do autonomous drive only with cameras. We have a LiDAR, we have a camera, we have radars. What the others do is based on their policy. And this is the point that we are discussing with the authorities as well, because we do not have a clear set of standards or rules, but to make it a level playing field and also to ensure the general safety yeah. of the public, the standards are also need to be set. How we should set the standards? The standards should be set based on the driving scenes. What they should detect and how it should react, not the exact sensors uh -huh. that are necessary or what kind of a computer that is necessary. That is just a tool. But here we have a, a question of um, redundancy. How can we get redundancy with only one technology? When one technology is limited, for example, by, by visibility. So if you have only a camera, you cannot see uh, something that only LiDAR could see. That's a very good point. And that, is, that was exactly why we have so many sensors today on our car in our research phase. Now, when we try to mass produce, we want to make sure that we don't density remains, but also to study how can we actually slim down our set of sensors so that in the future we can make this technology available to everyone. So how far are we? That's a very good question. I would like to have it, of course. Um, it's 10 years down the road. At least, yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, but I'll be still working. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll just, try to push. Just to be clear, so level four.